Case number one, this is a patient who has multiple nodules in the chest. They have a fever. Perhaps you'll elicit a history of intravenous drug abuse, as in this case. Should be a fairly easy one to start you off. Case number two, a few images from a thoracic aortic angiogram. Clearly something's amiss. What is your differential? How might you treat this patient? Case number three, a mass. I'll give you a zoomed in image here. Uh, how would you characterize the mass? Remember that you'll want to describe features including density. Will that allow you to say definitively that this is benign? What would your differential be for this lesion? Case number four, hopefully not too difficult, large lesion. What is your thoughts in terms of possible etiologies for it? Case number five, uh, this case is what one of my colleagues at UC would consider an eye poke, one of those things where you look at it for a while trying to say, well, is the abnormality here? Maybe it's over there. I want you to think about what happens if you have a chest x-ray in which things don't seem that abnormal, but the clinicians are saying this person has extensive disease. The apices are not the abnormality here. Case number six, consolidation. What are the common etiologies for consolidation? Can you be more specific as to possible organisms if you're thinking infection, as to possible cell types if you're thinking tumor? What sort of differential could you offer just from the chest radiograph alone? Case number six, always use the lateral film if that's provided. It can be very helpful in localizing a lesion into an anatomic compartment. Subtle lesions on a frontal projection can sometimes be very dramatic lesions on the lateral film. Case number eight, there is a primary abnormality with a lot of secondary findings. Are there any features of this primary abnormality that might help you narrow your differential consideration? What is your differential consideration for this process? Case number nine, perhaps there's an eponym that would apply in this setting. Notice the elevation of the hemidiaphragm, so there's volume loss in this right hemithorax. Case number 10, in my prior work at San Francisco General, one of the rules we think of is well, is this chest x-ray so bad that I would be willing to uh, walk in the elevator with this patient, maybe mingle at the salad bar in the cafeteria? Case number 11, a pair of images from a high-resolution CT scan. Notice the anatomic distribution of the abnormality. Characterize the lesions by their margins, their shape, their size, their anatomic distribution. So multiple cystic lesions on a high-resolution CT. What is your differential? Case 12, complication has occurred in this patient. What is it? What sort of complications can happen secondarily to the abnormality? How would you fix it if you were the unfortunate person who had to fix it? Case 13, the history as provided at the time that it happened. This was a patient who was getting a preoperative chest x-ray because of a diagnosis of DCIS on ultrasound-guided core. This is their preoperative chest x-ray. In this case, it's not so much the specific histologic diagnosis, but with a CT scan that looks like this, how might you obtain a tissue diagnosis? For those of you thinking, uh, as I would, is there any way someone else could get this diagnosis, the bronchoscopic biopsy was negative. Radiating chest pain, if you have a spine-type window, think maybe there's a spine-type abnormality on the film that you're seeing. What is your differential consideration? Are there abnormalities with a bone? Is there rib erosion? Are there soft tissue masses? How would those affect your differential? Case 15, this is a patient who underwent renal transplant. Uh, they are undergoing fairly aggressive immune modulation therapy. They're neutropenic, and they have this mass. What is your differential? Are there any eponyms for this abnormality that you might know? Uh, where would you steer the clinician in terms of etiologies, particularly in the setting of neutropenia? Case 16, classic chest radiograph. I show this because every once in a while I'd see a case, and it always takes me a couple of seconds before I say, oh, it's probably blank. But I just want you to see classic radiograph for this clinical entity. What might your differential be, if any? And why are you favoring that differential based on the anatomic distribution of the abnormalities on this chest x-ray? K17 should be fairly straightforward. Multiple masses along the chest wall. Are there things that can suggest uh, what may have contributed to the development of this malignancy? What are the risk factors that people have that might uh, occupationally or otherwise have predisposed them to developing this particular cancer? Case 18, hemoptysis. What does the air crescent sign mean to you and in what setting? You should think about why and when you use that particular term because there's two different occasions when you might use that. Case 19, again, think anatomically. We have a lesion. Where is it located? How can you tell? In this case, although you could say, well, maybe it's in the apex, it's actually posterior uh, in the posterior mediastinum. So what is your posterior mediastinal diff? What do you think this is based on the characteristics here on this chest x-ray? Case 20, a case of chronic consolidation in a patient coming out of a nursing home. Have they started off with a new TB? 
outbreak in a local nursing home that happened actually in one of our single room occupancy hotels. Everybody came down with multidrug resistant TB. Is this it? Is there some other possibility? What's your differential for chronic consolidation? Case 21, a patient with hypoxemia, they have dyspnea and a dry cough. What's the abnormality? When would you use high resolution CT or CT scan at all in a patient with this type of disease process? That's an important question to consider. Case number two, not the best example of this particular entity, but I think it shows the uh, small uh, pulmonary nodules to good effect. I want you to think, what is your differential when you're seeing nodules, particularly nodules with a branching pattern? Case 23, draining incision. I'll give you a clue that it was a history of a draining uh, sternal incision. Are there any features here on this film that might tell you that they're having sternal problems? And finally, case 24, another case of holes. As my wife, who's a gastroenterologist, likes to say, uh, for every hole, there is a doctor for that hole. And in this case, we're the doctors for these holes. What's your differential based on the distribution of these cystic lesions? What other things might you think about? Okay, let's go through and review these. Case number one, septic embolic disease. Patient with IV drug abuse, so-called shooter with a fever. If you see multiple masses like this, definitely think about that, especially if they're rapidly progressive. If you have a CT scan demonstrating multiple peripheral nodules, bigger and more numerous in the bases where there is more blood flow typically, so much the better. Not that long of a differential diagnosis that you wanna give in this particular clinical setting. Septic embolic disease. Case number two, one of those gut check moments for the interventionalist when you see this abnormality. This person presented actually because of blood initially thought to be pouring out of a chest tube. Actually, the blood was pouring out around a chest tube. And uh, we said, okay, we'll take a look. This was an aortic pseudoaneurysm. Remember, pseudoaneurysms are essentially contained ruptures, so kind of a bad thing. They're limited by the adventitia. They may be traumatic or mycotic. In this case, we actually had a little bit of both going on because of a chest tube that was rubbing against the pulsatile aorta uh, in the setting of an adjacent pneumonia. Chronic pseudoaneurysms in patients who survive their initial traumatic pseudoaneurysm uh, may calcify peripherally. That's a classic thing that you should look for on chest radiographs or CT scans. I'll show you some examples. So here's a patient, notice that in the uh, AP window, there's an extra curved calcific density just below the lump of the aortic arch. This was a calcified pseudoaneurysm. I'll show you the CT in the same patient. You can see this nice peripherally calcified lesion and the central enhancement after contrast administration. Uh, these most often now are treated by covered stents outside of the inflammatory mycotic setting. So in trauma, for instance, covered stents are a great way to treat these without the morbidity of an open surgical procedure. Case number three, the coned in image. Uh, internal fat is the main thing to look for here. There's a differential for fat containing lesions. This is a pulmonary parenchymal hamartoma, a benign lesion. Here's another classic example, coarse popcorn calcification within a mass. Should make you think of either a granuloma or a hamartoma. Fat density typically defined as less than 20 Hounsfield units, uh, excuse me, less than negative 20 Hounsfield units on a CT scan. Many hamartomas will show coarse calcification, many will show fat, but you don't necessarily see coarse calcification or fat in all hamartomas. So occasionally you'll biopsy a suspicious nodule that doesn't have any of these features and it will be a hamartoma. That's okay, that's one of the things that happens. You should have a differential for fat containing masses in the chest. Uh, that's outlined here. Hamartomas, lipomas, rarely liposarcomas. Remember, liposarcomas are often very aggressive and may not have any visible fat within them. Lipoid pneumonia, as I mentioned earlier, teratomas, and finally histoplasmomas also can have internal fat. But usually when you see internal fat, you're thinking hamartoma, if that's what you say, the vast majority of the time you'll be correct. Case number four, simply uh, showing another cavitary squamous cell carcinoma. Uh, they don't always have to be juxtahyalar or near the mediastinum, but they very often are. They have very thick, irregular walls, uh, particularly with fungating margins to these walls. You should really be thinking squamous cell carcinoma over lung abscess. Uh, greater than 15 millimeters in thickness, association with smoking, you know the drill. All right, case number five, the eye poke. This is a case of rib notching. If you don't believe me, I've got some magnified images. If you still don't believe me, I've got some arrows. Uh, we can see that there are notches under these ribs. As I said, sometimes you'll have a cardiac history that comes with this patient. I would hope so, because it would mean their primary doctor is doing their job. Uh, this is a person with severe collateral flow due to a severe coarctation. You can see the large epigastric arteries and the intercostal arteries uh, that have developed to circulate flow around the area of stenosis. 
If the abnormality is subtle and you have a chest x-ray and you're kind of staring blankly at it and they say, boy, this guy's sick and there's something going on, look for the notched ribs. Look for missing ribs. That's a classic thing to overlook is a rib that has a lytic lesion from a metastatic disease process or from a primary lytic lesion that you don't see because those are very subtle. Also look at the trachea and the airways. Sometimes there's an endobronchial, other endoluminal mass, or maybe you'll see an airway cutoff sign. Look for abnormal air in the neck and mediastinum. Look for abnormal air in the liver or the abdomen. Uh, I can tell you several occasions where the first abnormality that we saw in someone with severe abdominal disasters uh, was the chest x-ray that showed evidence of uh, air in the portal venous system. Consider also some other common entities and uncommon entities that are commonly shown to people in case conferences. For instance, things like congenital absence of the pericardium or achalasia. Look for things that suggest esophageal masses. Look for possible hernias. All right, case number six, this is really bread and butter, lobular consolidation, somewhat bulging contours. You should think about what are the common entities that cause this. Differential diagnosis for lobar pneumonia, the four most common, strep pneumonia, staph aureus, haemophilus influenza, and Klebsiella pneumonia. And really, if you just took the top three of those, you'd probably cover 80% of the community-acquired pneumonias that you see. The bulging fissure sign is often something attached to Klebsiella pneumonia, uh, but actually it's much more common with uh, strep pneumo, frankly. Aggressive infections can cavitate if you have a cavitary pneumonia. The two most common things are staph and strep. Even though staph is more likely to cavitate than strep infections are, strep infections are so much more common that if you really had to put your money on the table, uh, bet on strep and you'll be right more often than if you bet on staph. Finally, if you have a low bar pneumonia that's indolent, think about these other causes of chronic consolidation like tumors or tuberculosis. Think about what risk factors they have. Case number seven, subtle finding on the uh, frontal projection film, not so subtle on the lateral. We see a large anterior mediastinal mass occupying the retrosternal airspace. This is a young patient, 39 years of age. Uh, your differential for anterior mediastinal masses should be quite uh, quick and, and right on the tip of your tongue. Uh, this is an anterior mediastinal mass. Notice that there's a loss of the fat plane between this mass and the pulmonary artery. So this was actually an invasive thymoma. Thymomas, of course, being the most common anterior superior mediastinal mass. You can really only tell if they're invasive if you're seeing that loss of a fat plane and direct invasion. Most of the time, you actually don't recognize that, and it's up to a surgeon to explore them and find out whether or not there's that degree of contact. And frankly, MRI hasn't given us a a lot of extra help in differentiating invasive from non-invasive thymomas. The differential for the anterior mediastinal mass, just for your consideration again, uh, think of the terrible T's. Also think of trauma with mediastinal hematomas. Usually you've got a good story with that. Occasionally cystic lesions in kids, cystic hygromas, thymic cysts, a few things to add to the usual T's that you think about. Case number eight, I wouldn't expect you to come up with this as your differential. It really probably shouldn't be on a rational differential list, an endobronchial glomus. But I did want you to notice that this endobronchial mass with a post-obstructive atelectasis and the ipsilateral shift of the mediastinal, con uh, of the me mediastinal contents is actually quite uh, vascular in its appearance. So a lot of enhancement or apparent enhancement. The things that I would think of would be vascular metastatic disease like breast cancer or melanoma. Occasionally I'd also think about things like carcinoid, which can be quite vascular as well. This happened to be a glomus tumor on uh, surgical resection. Your differential for airway masses, Diego covered that earlier this morning. Think about cylindromas, think about squamous cell carcinomas, and regional invasion, as I mentioned earlier. This was a better example, frankly, of Golden's S sign than I had in my last talk. Here I'll outline it for you. Hyler mass, bulging, apical atelectasis because of post-obstructive uh, volume loss and that nice curved uh, contour between the collapsing upper lobe and the middle and lower lobes. Uh, here is the CT scan from this patient. Again, don't stick your biopsy needle into this atelectatic area unless you're seeing something else that suggests there's actually a mass there as well. The mass is typically not going to be there. It's going to be around the hilum. So you have to get to the hilum either with your needle or perhaps with a, a bronchoscopist's needle. So that's your lesion to biopsy. Among the named atelectases that you should know about, there's the Luftsickle or air sickle uh, from German left upper lobe atelectasis. I'll show you an example. Golden's S sign, the juxtaphrenic peak of apical volume loss. Very often we'll see that in the setting of patients who have uh, tuberculosis with a lot of apical scarring or they've had head and neck radiation with scarring, elevation of the hyla uh, and juxtaphrenic peaks, either on the left or right or bilaterally. The comet tail, which we mentioned in the last hour, talking about rounded atelectasis. And finally, the flat waist sign, which I'll show you an example of suggesting left lower lobe 
collapse. Uh, this is an example of loose sickle. This is actually a fairly uh, extreme example because very often you don't get this degree of opacification in the left chest. Classically, a loose sickle is upper lobe atelectasis on the left. The upper lobe collapses anteriorly, and you're shooting through a very thin collapse structure. So you'll see only a subtle increase in density. But if you see this lucency that's along the aortic arch, uh, think about the possibility of upper lobe collapse. That is actually the superior segment of the left lower lobe interposed up adjacent to the aortic arch because of the atelectasis, excuse me, the atelectasis or collapse of the left upper lobe. So here's a CT scan. Clearly this person has an exaggerated loose sickle because they actually have consolidation in their left, left upper lobe. But notice how the superior segment comes up and contacts the aortic arch. That's why you get this nice tissue differential uh, that forms the loose sickle sign. The flat waist sign is a relative straightening of the left heart border, not the most uh, glamorous of signs, but if you see it, think about left lower lobe collapse, uh, as in this patient, a very straight left heart border. Case number 10, this is a patient with post-primary tuberculosis. Notice the cavitation in the apices, the volume loss, the minor fissure is elevated, the hilum is elevated, there's a lot of scarring. When you look at these folks on CT, you get lots of irregular cavities, usually not one. Sometimes the walls can be fairly thick, uh, but sometimes the walls are very thin, and there's usually not a lot because of the apical location, the multiplicity of abnormalities, and often the evidence of adenopathy or a history of positive PPD uh, that makes you think, oh, well, could this be maybe a big cavitary squam? That's usually fairly clear by the anatomy and by the wall appearance. Okay, case number 11. This is a case of Langerhans cell histiocytosis, or uh, as the old guys will just say, EG. Irregular cysts in the apices. I'll magnify that up. Notice how irregular the margins are of these apically predominant cysts. So the fact that you have cysts of variable size, cysts of very irregular contour, and cysts that favor the apices, you should definitely be thinking about Langerhans cell histiocytosis. The differential for cystic pulmonary disease in addition to Langerhans cell histiocytosis, think about LAM, lymphangioliomyomatosis. Uh, think about maybe you're looking at a case of emphysema with superimposed interstitial edema. That can certainly make it look like you have multiple cysts. Maybe the patient has bronchiectasis. There are a few uh, outliers, miscellaneous causes, things like uh, juvenile tracheolaryngeal papillomatosis. One that you should consider if you have the right history, which is either a history of HIV or more commonly a history of autoimmune disease like rheumatoid arthritis is LIP. So this was covered this morning, but lymphocytic interstitial pneumonia often can present with cysts or small nodules. This was a case of catheter embolization. This was a patient who came in completely asymptomatic, but sometimes uh, these patients can have very severe complications. The classic location of this is at one of the pinch points as the catheter crosses into the thoracic inlet. Uh, by chronic motion, there can be weakness instilled into the catheter itself, and they can fragment, and there's actually a catheter fragment sitting in the heart. Uh, we can see that to slightly better effect on the CT scan, uh, right ventricular chamber, free-floating catheter fragment. So what are the problems with this, and how do you treat it? Uh, the common problems that you have to worry about are dysrhythmia, uh, but the severe problems, though more rare, include erosion through the myocardium and pericardial tamponade, so sudden death. So you really should try to get this catheter out of the heart if you can. Recovery, uh, you should have some ideas how you might recommend recovering this if you were uh, on call or if you were being examined. Think about maybe pulling it out of the heart for starters so you can decrease your risk of ectopy, getting it into the inferior vena cava, for instance, where you can loop it and snare it and remove it. Case number 13, this was uh, indeed a 50-year-old woman with DCIS. She has this large mass. Uh, as you know, this would be a very uncommon presentation for in situ carcinoma to have a big uh, mediastinal mass. And I showed you this CT scan image. Um, how would you biopsy this if the bronchoscopist couldn't, couldn't get it? Well, some of my colleagues would say, I still wouldn't. I'd make the bronchoscopist go back again. Uh, that's fair sometimes. Um, but the other thing to consider as well, is there a safe way where I don't have to cross lung to get into this mass? And one of the things that you can do with a negative bronchoscopic biopsy is select a path that minimizes the risk to the patient. That's what you want to do all always. But in this case, what you can do is come in along the spine and even inject a little bit of sterile saline into this area to expand the tissue plane that you have to creep along the spine and get into this lesion. And that's what we did in this case. Now, I'm no pathologist, but this is a funny looking biopsy specimen. Lots of red irregular stuff. It doesn't look like your typical cancer cells that we look at. And this ended up being a fairly rare lesion, a so-called mediastinal desmoid. There's only a handful of these reported. So don't put that at the top of your differential. I wanted you to think about how would I approach actually getting getting tissue, uh, bronchoscopic biopsy if you can get it with a large subcarinal lesion. If not, find a safe pathway towards biopsying the lesion if you possibly can. 
Case number 14, uh, chest pain, spine pain, back pain, in addition to aortic issues, always think about the spine. This was a case of POTS disease. Here are the CT and post-GAD sagittal MR images from the same patient. Notice the extensive bony destruction. Notice the focal kyphosis at that level and the sublingamentous spread of the epidural abscess that we're seeing on the sagittal MR. POTS disease, of course, tuberculous spondylitis. Uh, you often have very severe local destruction of the disc and the adjacent vertebral bodies. It's not a very common manifestation of TB, fortunately, but remember you can get tuberculous spondylitis without pulmonary disease. In fact, it's very often that you have that situation. It's spread via Batson's venous plexus and subligamentous spread to adjacent vertebral bodies. Okay, case number 15, this is an example of the halo sign on CT, ground glass opacity surrounding a mass in the apex in someone who I said was neutropenic. And the neutropenic feature is, is actually very important. In the setting of neutropenia, the presence of a halo sign is highly suggestive of invasive aspergillus. Outside the setting of neutropenia, it's very nonspecific. So beware of the possibility of fungal infections in your transplant patients, patients with severe immune suppression from chemotherapy or other marrow suppression. And again, outside of neutropenia, think of other diseases, including just run-of-the-mill infection. Uh, this is an example of cystic fibrosis. This is bread and butter. You should think of it very quickly as soon as you see upper lobe predominant uh, bronchiectasis in a young patient. As you know, it's a problem with uh, transmembrane, transmembrane chloride channel. Not going to uh, worry too much about that right now. Mean survival is increasing all the time, particularly with more aggressive antibiotic therapies. So you're going to see more and more adults who present with a long history of cystic fibrosis. Uh, apical predominant bronchiectasis, plugging, recurrent pneumonias, usually this is not much of a clinical mystery. Differentials for bronchiectasis based on where you see it, though. Upper lobes, think TB, sarcoid, and cystic fibrosis. Especially if you have bronchiectasis in the middle lobe and the lingula, think about atypical mycobacterial infection. We'll cover that in another case. If you have central bronchiectasis, particularly with high-density mucus plugs, you may think of allergic bronchopulmonary aspergillosis, sometimes central bronchiectasis with or without plugs, certainly without typically the high-density plugs of ABPA. You might have a case of Williams-Campbell. The vast majority of bronchiectasis that you see in the lower lobes is going to be from chronic bronchitis in the setting of emphysema and COPD, or the traction bronchiectasis that you see in interstitial diseases, which we've already covered. K17, mesothelioma, invasive chest wall mass, not a very difficult uh, finding to appreciate on this examination. Note the presence of calcified plaque, which suggests a history of asbestos exposure. Uh, the occupations besides working in a shipyard, the classic for asbestos that you really should think about, pipe fitters, people who work in old buildings, people who worked with brake pads in the 60s and 70s, which has asbestos in them uh, because of its heat uh, absorb, uh, absorbing characteristics. Uh, think about these other occupations besides just did they work over at the local shipyard when you see mesothelioma. A few different types of asbestos-related diseases, pleural plaques, sometimes calcified, sometimes not, have a shorter latency than malignancy. So usually you'll see plaques, then you'll see plaques plus invasive masses to think mesothelioma. Now, asbestosis is different from asbestos-related pleural disease where you get plaques. Asbestosis looks, for all the world, like interstitial fibrosis, and in fact, it's very hard to separate IPF from asbestosis except with the exposure history. So look for the honeycombing, look for the exposure uh, findings such as calcified plaques. You can get round atelectasis, of course. So this is an example of asbestosis. The high-resolution lung windows looks a lot like idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis, basilar, subpleural predominant, honeycombing, traction bronchiectasis, has all of these nice features. There's calcified plaques, so I definitely say that this could be asbestosis. Mycetomas, I said there are different types of air crescents. This person has two air crescents, one in each apex with a rounded mass within each of these cavities. Of course, in this case, the fungus is just a guest within this cavity within the lung parenchyma, the so-called mycetoma. In the old days, the hardcore clinicians claimed that you could actually make this diagnosis by vigorously shaking a patient and hearing these rattling around. Uh, if you flip the patient over, you can see this little fungus ball drop dependently with a little plop uh, as you flip the patient over. This is another air crescent, a very different clinical scenario. This is the air crescent in angioinvasive aspergillus. An air crescent sign in this setting is in someone with neutropenia who has that halo sign, but as they get treated and begin to have a reaction, a response of their immune system to this infection, they can actually get necrosis around the area of infection, and because of that necrosis, you can get a little bit of an air crescent around this necrotic area of tissue, infection, 
and uh, fungal mycelia. So this is a different type of air crescent. This is a patient with immune compromise, severe, getting better. They develop an air crescent from a necrotic area of angioinvasive disease as opposed to uh, colonization of a pre-existing cavity from tuberculosis or whatever their prior disease was. Case number 19, just to remind you about posterior mediastinal mass differentials, two major actors when you're looking at a lesion, as in this case, smooth, circumscribed, adjacent to the spine. If you look at it on MR, you can see that it's emerging from the neural foramina and has many features of a schwannoma. So this was a schwannoma. It's benign. It's slow growing. The other major thing in your differential consideration is neurofibroma. In the chest world, if you're presented with one of these, often someone is following that discussion with, would you like to biopsy this? And your answer really should be, no, I would not like to biopsy this, because this is one of those cases where you put a needle into a nerve and the patient's going to be very unhappy with you. So if you are forced to do it, make sure that you have reinforcements and those reinforcements are carrying uh, good drugs. Um, these can be iso-intense to the cord on T1. They enhance, you know, the drill with schwannomas. Differential for posterior mediastinal masses, definitely think about neurogenic lesions. As I mentioned, what else lives there? Nerves, so nerve sheath tumors. The spine, so think about osteomyelitis or tuberculous spondylitis. Uh, think about aortic aneurysms, boctalic hernias, other things of that sort. All right. Case number 20, this was a patient from a local convalescent hospital. He was actually being uh, administered mineral oil for a bowel regimen, but he also was aspirating quite frequently. This is lipoid pneumonia. Chronic consolidation, lipoid pneumonia is in your differential in the right clinical setting. Now, lipoid pneumonia doesn't have to be fat density like I showed you in the earlier lecture. It can be a very nonspecific confluent area of opacification. On a pathologic standpoint, these can be very hemorrhagic. You lavage someone, it can be very bloody. But when you lavage them, they have to get special stains to look for the presence of mineral oil or other lipids. And that's the so-called oil red O stain. So all of this red stuff is a lipid material from the bronchoalveolar lavage in this patient. You also, in this setting, can get fat-laden macrophages from lavage, and that's what this image shows, again, from the same patient. I got a lot of hay out of there. Chronic aspiration of lipid-rich material, mineral oil, mineral spirits, Vicks vapor rub, things like that. Starts as a hemorrhagic bronchopneumonia. Over time, this can evolve to a very inflammatory fibroglobastic abnormality in the lung parenchyma, so you can get extensive scarring over time. Case number 21, a patient with dyspnea, cyanosis, dry cough, especially if they have AIDS, you should be thinking of pneumocystis pneumonia. Diffuse ground glass opacities on the chest x-ray. Later on, this is a different patient, you can get extensive confluent holes in the lung, pneumatoceles and pneumocystis pneumonia. You can get spontaneous pneumothoraces from pneumocystis pneumonia. It's caused by a slight nomenclature change, perhaps from the last time you thought about this, caused by pneumocystis gyrovecchii. It's typical presentation. They usually have at least two or three of these features, a low-grade fever, dyspnea, hypoxemia, and cough. If they don't have at least two or three of these, usually you're dealing with something else. Pleural effusions are rare. If you see them, think about another infectious cause or pulmonary edema. Pneumatoceles, when present, favor the upper lobes. And an important point about high-resolution CT in this setting is that many people will have diffuse abnormalities on their chest x-ray. If they don't and you have the suspicion for pneumocystis pneumonia, get the high-resolution CT. Very sensitive. Uh, you'll have about 15% of patients with florid findings on high-res that you really won't pick up on a chest x-ray because they're subtle and diffuse abnormalities. So high-resolution CT helps to exclude or confirm disease in the presence of a normal chest x-ray with strongly suspicious clinical features. All right, case number 22, as I mentioned, maybe not the best example of MAC, but a reasonable example of endobronchial nodules. I'll show you a better example of MAC. Lots of tree and bud type nodules with bronchiectasis in the middle lobe and the lingula. Classic sort of clinical scenario, older patient, older women, the so-called Lady Windermere syndrome with a chronic cough, months or years of cough. So look for bronchiectasis in tree and bud, classically in a middle lobe and lingular distribution. I think this is more common than is typically appreciated uh, in, in the rest of the medical community. Uh, next to last case here, sternal dehiscence. They had drainage from their sternal wound. Notice the prior film and compare it to the present film, and there's a vertical area of air lucency that's now projected over the sternum. So that's not right. If you look at them on a close-up image, you can also see that these sternal wires are starting to pull apart and fray, and that's a sign that you should be thinking sternal dehiscence. It's a rare complication of sternotomy. It can happen in the immediate post-procedural period. It can also happen in delayed fashion. Watch for change in the alignment of the sternal wires. They don't have to be fractured, and I'll show you an example of uh, this happening without wire fracture. 
So here's the patient uh, that we saw in the chest x-ray. Notice on the pre dehiscence CT, the two fragments of the sternum pretty closely opposed in this fresh post-operative CT. Here, later on, we can see the air is interposed between the two halves of the sternum. Uh, here's an example, sternal dehiscence uh, without wire fragmentation. Notice all of these sternal wires are lined up except for that one at the bottom, which is way over to the other side. So maybe the surgeon was, you know, thinking, oh gosh, there's a little piece of the xiphoid I'm going to wire together. This actually was a case where on CT you can see that all of these wires except for the bottom one went with the right half of the sternum as the sternum dehisced. This last wire went with the left half of the sternum. So that uh, change in the alignment of the sternal wires is a clue to sternal dehiscence. All right, case number 24, this is a young woman with diffused cysts in the lung. Some of them have uh, very clearly defined thin walls with sometimes mural nodules, not always. Think about tuberous sclerosis. And the reason to think about it is that this is actually a very bad actor. People have a very bad prognosis with tuberous sclerosis. Occasionally also you'll see a case like this accompanied by an image through the abdomen, maybe an image showing a fatty mass uh, in the kidney or an AML. So that's what this is. This is a patient with lymphangiomyomatosis, tuberous sclerosis. Essentially, these are spectrums of the same disease. About 1% of patients with tuberous sclerosis will have LAM. Uh, LAM can be thought of as a form fruist of, of tuberous sclerosis. Characteristic pulmonary features, randomly distributed, similar size, thin-walled cysts in the lung parenchyma. As we saw, patients may present with spontaneous pneumothoraces or even chylothorax, and classically this affects women of childbearing age. Uh, death typically in about 10 years from progressive hypoxia.